Good evening. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the Executive Director of the University of Chicago Francis and Rose Yuen Campus in Hong Kong, our premier location in Asia, representing U Chicago values of free and open discourse, rigorous debate, and the exchange of ideas. Welcome to the Pop Asia series. We're sharing tonight's event live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube from the U Chicago Yuen Campus in Hong Kong. If audience members have questions to submit, you can do so through the questions and answer button by first registering on Zoom. I also encourage you to visit our website at www.uchicago.hk and subscribe to our e-news for the latest news and information. Or you can also follow us on our UChicago UN Campus social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. GGN, our study abroad program manager, and during COVID, our special projects coordinator for the UN campus, will wrap up tonight's program with a poll and more information about upcoming events you might be interested in. So be sure to stay tuned until the very end to complete the questions. Last week, we talked about video games and a different game cultures in the US and Asia, focusing mostly on China, Japan, and South Korea. This week, we'll talk about the various video game genres that are prevalent in Asia. Let's get started with brief introductions of our guest speakers. Professor Thomas Lamar teaches the, at the Department of Cinema and Media Studies, East Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. Professor Lamar is a scholar of media cinema and animation, intellectual history and material culture, with projects ranging from the communication networks of ninth century Japan, silent cinema and the global imaginary, animation technologies, and infrastructure ecologies. His current projects include research on animation that addresses the use of animals in the formation of media networks associated with colonialism and extraterritorial empire, and the consequent politics of animism and speciesism. As a translator, some of the major translations that Professor Lamar has completed include Japanese and French works like Death Sentences, Gilbert Simondon, and The Philosophy of the Trans Individual. Melos Hantani graduated from the University of Chicago with a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science in 2013. He's currently Tokyo-based and serves as the director and game designer at Analgesic Production. He co-created Anadine One Plus Two and Even the Ocean, and also made All Our Asias. He writes about games on his blog, Melodic Ambient Two, and is now working on Sephony. Melos composes music for games and standalone projects. And from 2016 to 2019, Melos was a game designer and game music lecturer at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Alan Kwan is a lecturer of media design at the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts. His research focuses, explores the intersection between immersive technologies and the performing arts. Alan's artistic and design practices explores new possibilities of gaming and real-time 3D technologies that depart from the traditional video game paradigm and typical tech fantasies of AR and VR. His projects have been presented in Austria, Germany and Shanghai, uh, and were featured in media, including Discovery Channel and Popular Science. Alan was awarded the first prize of the MIT Schnitzer Prize, honorary mention in pre R Electronica, and the Asian Cultural Council Fellowship. And Alan holds a master's in science in art, culture, and technology from MIT. And finally, Patrick Jagoda is back with us from the University of Chicago. Professor Jagoda is a professor of cinema and media studies and English at the University of Chicago. He's the executive editor of Critical Inquiry and director of the Weston Game Lab. He's also co-founder of the Game Changer Chicago Design Lab and Transmedia Story Lab and a member of the Forecast Lab Collective. He's currently working on his next book, Story Lab, Narrative Methods for a Transmedia Era. Patrick has designed numerous alternate reality games, video games, and board games about issues that include climate change, public health, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And Patrick is a recipient of the 2020 Guggenheim Fellowship. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Patrick, so nice to have you back for the third episode. 
I'll hand the program over to you so that you can get the conversation started. Great, thank you so much, Mark. We're really excited to have these guests today. Um, and so I wanna jump right into it and talk about different video game genres across Asia. Um, so let's start with uh, Thomas Lamar. So Tom, uh, you're a specialist in East Asian media, including Japanese manga, anime, television, and video games. And, and to help set up uh, our more specific conversation about popular game genres, could you tell us about the Japanese game scene? So first of all, how does the Japanese video game market operate differently from the US in terms of imports and exports, uh, the circulation of games within Japan, and the interplay between professional and amateur designers? And then second of all, given that Japan doesn't have quite as extensive an academic study of games within universities as does the United States, uh, I wonder what forms of games criticism and writing um, have you been seeing in Japan? Thanks, Patrick. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I love this question about video game genres. And I think with the questions you're asking, we can really begin to think about the way in which certain kinds of market forces, as well as the role of gamers and informal circuits of playing, really impact the way we think about something like genre. When I think of the Japanese game industry and what makes it a little bit different, it mostly goes back to me to the prevalence of transmedia or cross-media franchising. In other words, it's really hard to take games outside of a kind of expanded field of media forms that would include manga, anime, um, and even various kinds of games interacting with these media forms. And there is a history to that. Um, in the last section, Jennifer DeWinter talked a lot about the importance of ubiquity in the Japanese game market, that games are for everyone. Um, and this, this has a long history of the association of games, both with television um, and the electronics industry and a certain kind of export model. But it also means that games attain a certain ubiquity by having different genres within them and by crossing across genres to attract different kinds of people to games in very different ways. So sometimes in Japan, this model is called media mix model. I guess it's the default term for referring to this cross media franchise. But even when we think about this history of what we think is the sort of signature style of Japanese games, it goes back to manga, right? Like even characters like Mario that you're wearing, in many ways, the impact of Mario came from, and Donkey Kong came from this relation to the familiarity of their feel for um, manga. So in that sense, the Japanese game industry is part of this broader media network of production, but it's also fairly decentralized it doesn't have this overarching control. Some, some publishers try to exert control over licenses of multiple domains, but generally speaking, there's a certain sort of play or autonomy in the way, say, a manga would approach something versus, some, versus an anime or a game. So this leads to a situation that feels very open, not only to a lot of different audiences, but it also invites um, what we call amateur production. In Japan, this is called dojin, and that's probably a better term because it's really hard to define because it's not really amateur, it's really people almost developing their own informal collectives to produce things. Um, and it's these factors, I think, that lead to certain ways of thinking about genres or game formats. I mean, the first example that comes to mind for me that I think everyone would know would be a visual novel called Higurashi no Nakakoro ni, or Higurashi When They Cry, which is a visual novel, but its designer and writer, Yukishi07, was really attracted to what would be known as a crying game. So he wanted a, a kind of action that makes you cry. Um, so it is a crime game, but then he mixed horror elements into it. So it's also a horror game, but then it's also kind of a dating sim if you want it to be. Um, it also has elements of apocalypse. So 
in, in some ways, I think one of the ways to think about this or what I'd offer is to say that when we look at a game like this that really comes out of doujin production, it's multiple genres within a format. So the visual novel becomes this amazing format that allows a game designer to play with multiple genres, but then these multiple genres speak to other media. Um, and that game in particular was very aware this game is gonna be a manga. This game is gonna be an anime. This game is gonna be a drama CD. So how do you think about making the game experience already speak into these other kinds of experiences? Um, and the last thing I'll mention is simply that this also affects the way people talk about games. Japan is somewhat different in that popular culture is not as prevalent in universities. There's still a certain sense that things like manga and games are not worthy of academic study. There's some work, but not a lot, but there's a burgeoning group of cultural commentators who have a lot of clout in Japan in, in mass media and among fans who write about games, but they often write about them in these broader media contexts. Like it's very rare for anyone to produce knowledge about games in isolation from other media. So I think that's also been an effect of even the way the knowledge of games is produced. Great, thank you, Tom. That's a really economical and expansive way to start this off and gives us a, a sense of one context in Japan. Um, so I'm gonna move on to uh, Melos, who is actually in Japan, in Tokyo. And Melos, you're, you're an independent video game designer. So I'd like to talk a little bit more um, about the craft of game design with you later in the episode. But yeah. to start off, Let's talk about core genres of games in, in Asia. And you know, there, there are some well-known trends. So for instance, in China, um, many players prefer mobile games, including um, casual strategy, chess, gambling games, things like that. In Japan, uh, more players seem to be drawn to console-based and anime-related games, like uh, many of the things that Tom was talking about, role-playing games, visual novels, dating sims. Um, and then as we talked about in our last episode in South Korea, we've seen uh, more in the way of, of esports and massively multiplayer online games uh, and games engaged in uh, PC bang culture. So I guess, what are some of the most popular or prominent game genres across Asia in your observation? And I'd especially love to hear you talk about um, freemium games or gotcha games, uh, which are huge in Japan, uh, but also China and Korea. Yeah, so uh, what Thomas just mentioned about hikurashi or just generally games that speak to multiple genres, I think that ties into this answer a bit interestingly, because if you invert that, you can think about um, in the past decade on the scale of like popular games amongst Asia, but also, you know, the USA and other uh, like Western countries, there's this tendency of um, genres sort of being unified under one philosophy of like design. So we have genres like uh, like sandbox games like Minecraft, mm -hmm. um, puzzle games like Candy Crush, you know, MMOs like World of Warcraft, uh, MOBAs like League of Legends, um, dating sims, uh, idol raising <laughs> games, mm -hmm. uh, infinite runners, uh kind of like base building kingdom management games those are all like popular and they might have their regional variants uh like there's certain depending on the country they might have one very popular uh, league of legends like but despite all the differences in these kinds of games and genres i feel like there's well there's probably more than three but three sort of themes come to mind across all these different genres um, one of them is, I guess, the sense of progress within the game's design. And by that, I mean, uh, say Minecraft, you're building a home. That's kind of like a goal. You're trying to progress in that sense. Um, if you're playing a MOBA, like League of Legends, ascending ranks is progress. Um, if you're playing a gacha game like Genshin Impact or Grand Blue Fantasy, then getting characters and strengthening them, that's the sense of progress. Um, and I would say, you know, that strand of like progress is kind of tied to uh <laughs> not to get too particularly heavy but maybe the lack of meaning in 
the average kind of corporate working life or whatnot. And so, you know, you have that sense of progress you can achieve in the game. Um, not that that's bad in all cases, but that's just a tendency I see. And then a second tendency is the sense of consuming and passing time. So if you think of a game like Candy Crush, you tend to play that on like a commute or like in free time, you can play it in very fast sessions. Um, you know, we can tie that to like high stress working culture or lack of capacity to do anything after you're exhausted from work. Um, and then I think the third kind of strand of stuff I see in like popular game genres across Asia and that, that I think was maybe popularized the most from maybe Japan and Korea is I guess like the sense of like desire for a character. So if you think about dating sims, games where you date people, if you think about gacha games, a lot of these are about collecting characters. So, you know, collecting many times girls um, or collecting uh people like to call them like wives and husbands in <laughs> certain games. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things we can try to think of, analyze the psychology of that. But the point is that, um, you know, across all these genres of games, we kind of see these three kind of like strands, right? You know, mm -hmm. the sense of making progress, consuming your time uh, just to, you know, get to the end of the day or like the sense of like desire for another like character. Um, and, I just to go a little bit faster. Uh, I think in Asia, so the West kind of created like freemium games like Zynga, Farmville. But in Asia, I think there's a more focus on innovation and like kind of MMO RPG forms of gameplay. Uh, so uh, the gacha game as a form that was popularized in Japan. Um, and I think. You know, so we have all these different genres, but they all kind of have a little bit of these like threads in them. And I think gacha games, freemium games, or gacha games in particular, they kind of symbolize this overarching tendency that I see the game industry going towards. Um, uh, in the sense that you have these gacha games and they kind of act as these like machines that they take people's kind of like discontent uh, with the world or like anxiety, just general negative feelings. And they kind of transform that into uh, one, a lot of money for the people making these games because there's a lot of gambling involved in playing them, but also, um, you know, sometimes positive experiences, but sometimes addictive tendencies. Uh, yeah, so just to relate that. So if, an example of how gacha games do this in particular is these games kind of hook you in by releasing new characters periodically and that's kind of the desire element right you you either play the game as someone spending a lot of money and you try to like gamble for this character or you play it as a free-to-play player and you spend hours and hours every day not every day every week trying to grind for like these little tokens in the game that you can use to gamble for those characters um and they're also designed to like fit into your day and pass time so th thanks to kind of gotcha games, there's like this vocabulary word of like dailies. It's kind of like daily tasks you do in a game to get the little tokens to like, you know, gamble. Um, and then in gotcha games are also, they have that very big sense of like progress, right? So if you think of Genshin Impact, it looks like a game where you're adventuring around and talking to characters and going through stories. And to an extent it is, but, it's also a collection of these very repetitive, like perfunctory tasks that kind of put you on this treadmill to like make your characters stronger. But the thing is, you know, and this is kind of common to all gacha games is that as your characters get stronger, the challenges also become more, uh, the, the monsters kind of get, say, say you're like, you know, attacking a monster doing a lot of damage. And if you level up your character in a gacha game, the game usually scales those monsters to be stronger. So there's always this kind of like carrot stick of, you know, oh, you can work every single day of a week to make progress, but we're just gonna raise the bar a bit. So, you know, and then, you know, you see that those tendencies in other games, right? So, you know, progress, you see those in a skill-based game like uh, League of Legends, you can get really good at that game um, and like work with teams to kind of ascend your ranks. Uh, but I think those three things, you know, they're symbolized by gacha games. And uh, I would say that the way gacha games and those tendencies, how they tie into game industry as a whole, is that to me, there kind of seem to be two camps of 
large scale game creation, which is one is this kind of like exploitation of <laughs> discontent, uh, which is symbolized by the gotcha game, right? Um, but on the other hand, you have, I call kind of call it like a funism, like traditionalist funism, um, symbolized by like Nintendo or like single player games, right? It's a, it's a style of game design, which is like, oh, games should be about fun and be for fun. Um, you see a lot of uh, game directors talking about why they make games. Um, the other day, the creator of Super Smash Brothers, not creator, the director of Smash Brothers, um, Sakurai, was talking about, oh, I make games for people to have fun, right? And that's, you know, so you see those like two camps and there's a huge variety of experiences and they're, they're not like all bad, right? You know, there's little good things to them, but that's kind of like the tendencies that I see across all games in the world, but in particular Asia. Um, and I feel like with those two camps of game design, it doesn't leave a lot of room for other ideas to, to exist. Um, they kind of create, and, and an issue is that they create these sorts of uh, ancestries of game design ideas. And so, you know, the ideas being passed down about game design, they tend to be more and more gravitating to these two like poles of like, oh, it's all about fun or it's all about creating something with a lot of hot anime chicks um, and getting people to spend a lot of time playing. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like, that's what I see. And there are independent developers, you know, doing other interesting things, but, uh, from the standpoint of an artist working in the field, it's, you know, you kind of always look at it and you're like, oh, it doesn't look that great right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, that, that's really helpful, Melos. And, and we'll come back to some of these questions, including around anxiety, I think, uh, later, later in the episode, if we have time. Um, for now, I'll move on to, to Alan and start off with, with a question. Um, and so Alan, like, like Melos, you're a game designer, though in your case, you were born in Hong Kong and continue to design there. Um, and so I wonder as, as a way of going even deeper into this question of, of locality and local trends, um, could you um, tell us a little bit about what you've seen uh, around the uh, video game industry uh, in Hong Kong and the way that it's changed during your time there? And I'm also interested in how beyond genre games, you see art games developing both in Hong Kong itself as well as other parts of Asia over the last decade. In other words, also, you know, what does it mean for you to be part of the art game scene there? Um, sure. Um, thanks for the question, Patrick. Um, so in terms of like how I've seen the video game industry in Hong Kong changes, I guess I would just use like a personal story I like to illustrate it. So, I was like born and raised in Hong Kong. And like when I was like a kid, I got like my first game console, which was like a PlayStation 1, right? And then at that time when I was in primary school, most of the games that I played on PlayStation was like all games made by, I mean, Japan, right? So meaning like all the like character dialogues and all the subtitles, all the storylines are in Japanese like characters, right? And then at that time, like it wasn't so popular for like Japanese games in Hong Kong to have like a Chinese version that is sell, right? So like, uh, as a kid, like we have this like really funny and interesting experience that we play, play the whole game, like trying to have fun, but we didn't exactly know what the story is really about or like what the characters are we like saying, like, right? So it can be like both like fun and frustrating trying to guess like what the game was really talking about. But then like my classmate and I like figure out like they were just like books like selling in the market. And they were written like in Chinese. Like for example, uh, there was this game like called like uh, the Biohazard, right? And then uh, there would be this book like uh, written special, uh, written specifically for Biohazard that like gave all the storylines in the like, Chinese. Like they gave all the backstories for all the characters. So it's kind of like a fiction like to read, super interesting to read. And then it also gave like all the instruction and guidelines to help you like to play the levels and stuff like that. So to me, like it has like a really profound impact on me as a media artist because like it was sort of like the first like transmedia sort of experience like for me, like to go between like the game and the book and like back and forth. And that's like kind of interesting, right? And then um, those books were actually made by some like local um, game distribution or like game promotion companies in Hong Kong that try to uh, localize like the game. But then like 20 years later right now, like. Uh, we don't see those folks like exist in Hong Kong anymore because like those, like these folks like 
were like are replaced by like social media or like more game promotion work can be like promoted internationally through like social media and like through like international app stores and stuff like that right so like right now like a lot of those companies in hong kong like are gone so i feel like 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 that kind of like era is like gone um in terms of like art game as far as i know like i'm not sure if there's like a scene in hong kong because like are i think like but there are like fewer than like 10 people doing like art games in hong kong because like and by art games i think i mean like um games that try to challenge like the mainstream mode of like a game design or like people who try to use video game as a medium for self-expression or artistic expression or like uh, stuff like that like more experimental way of like making games and like um it's still like a pretty new thing in hong kong and also like um ultimately like like game production takes a lot of time and money to make and hong kong is like a very expensive city to live in so like that's like game artists or game designers like who work independently like we try to like secure funding and stuff like that right um and in in the ecosystem in hong kong like we either get like funding from like the game world or like from like the art world right and like we feel kind of like in the limbo in between because like art world like feels like art game is kind of like game is kind of like a teenage boy thing and then like the um video game world feels like art game is kind of like a bit like uh, pretentious and, and and stuff like that right so like to me it's like an interesting limbo space that like uh, there isn't really like an art game scene here but it's also like a good thing because like no one really cares like uh, what you do and like it really push you to like try to pursue like international like um funding and stuff like that which is like a good thing like to try and experiment when you work as an artist so i guess like yeah that's my feedback to the question great thank you so much um so now let's move everybody back on screen um and i'll keep asking questions but um you know people should feel free to come in um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna cycle through and go go back to Tom. So Tom, I, I want to follow up on what you were speaking about just a moment ago and zoom into like one particular game series that um, that people might be more familiar with, right? So one of my favorite Japanese game series that we've talked about together is Persona, uh, which was created by the developer Atlas. And this is a game series that moves among so many different genres, right? I mean, let's take an example of, of the most recent release, um, major release from them, uh, Persona 5. And this is, this is a fairly long game, right? That takes 100 to 150 hours, depending on how you play it. And in the midst of that time, the game throws so many genres at you, right? You have the action component of the dungeon crawler with role-playing game uh, mechanics. But then when you're not grinding through a dungeon, you also engage in a life simulator in which you decide whether to go shopping or what kinds of jobs to take and who you want to spend time with. So in fact, there's essentially a dating simulator mini game that plays out during the duration of Persona 5. And on top of all of that, you also have an education simulation in which you go to school and you occasionally have to take quizzes that impact your stats. And then, you know, beyond gameplay genres, we could even say, right, the, the narrative draws heavily, as you were saying, from manga and anime. Um, and, and even at the level of audio, right, you have a soundtrack that moves between disco and jazz and funk and soul and pop and hard rock. And, and in some ways, right, you know, again, as we've talked about in the past, Persona is less a game than it is a world. And so I would love to hear you talk a little bit about how you think through a game series like that uh, in the context of the longer history of Japanese game genres. Yeah, thanks. I mean, you gave a really, you gave such a nice overview of Persona 5 and it's it's not atypical within that series, right? Persona 3 and Persona 4 started to do some of these th same things. And I think that one of the ways in which we can think about this um, is somewhat in the terms that Malos was already given us, right? When he says there really are these different kinds of ways of moving through games. Like he was talking about the way you could have something that's progressive, something that's wasting time, something where you put something at risk. And I think that's a really nice way to think about how worlds develop um, in relation to these different genres that you were mentioning inside uh, Persona 5, because part of the art of these games is to produce a complex temporal experience. 
So you feel like you're moving forward. It could be solving a mystery. It could be defeating a villain. It could be avoiding the apocalypse. But then suddenly you're going laterally and you're just wasting time, like you're shopping, right? You're, you're doing these very different kinds of activities whose temporality is evoking a relation of daily life that's a little bit different from the other kind of temporality, much like Melos was saying. And then finally you get these moments where something has to be at risk for the game to feel real. And so you get this moment where you have to stake something or make a wager, because if you don't, you're not going to find a real ending for yourself. So in that sense, the game doesn't have one ending, right? Like there's, it's not just simply progressively ending or you waste enough time that you acquire enough things. But I think it's the interaction of those three kinds of things that makes for a world. Um, and it's a world then that really works across other kinds of media because particularly with Persona 5 and 4 and 3 for that matter, but they're getting better and better at it. They have anime series that very closely parallel the game world. And so, but the anime can't function the same way because it's working in a serial manner, right? So you're remixing those same temporalities. So then the importance of the music and other features that link the game to the anime to make you know you're in the same world, but you're now gonna have yet another kind of temporal experience of moving through that world. So I think that's one way in which we can start to think about how these cross-media worlds work when they emerge out of games. And I think that for me, what games have really given these cross-media franchises is an increasingly complex sense of temporality. Um, notions of reset in particular, it just become key to the way people think about daily life. Yeah, and, and, and that idea of like uh, the spin-off anime to, to Persona, for instance, is, is great because the game itself, right, of course also has anime cutscenes, uh, some of which are fairly long. We talked a little bit about that last episode more generally, but, the, but it's even embedded within the game in addition to being part of this transmedia ecology. Um, yeah, and I think that what's interesting is the game is really pushing the quality of animation in new directions. <laughs> like this, it's kind of surprising that actually the, the, the mechanics for game design are forcing animation to adopt new kinds of stylistics, which is unusual because usually it was the other way around. Totally. Um, so, okay, so let's still talk about genre, but I wanna move a little bit more into also thinking about uh, form. And so I'll go to, to Mello. So, you know, I'm, I'm in a media studies department with, with Thomas, but I'm also in an English department. So I'm interested in literary works and I know both literary and art historical influences are near and dear to your heart as a, as a game designer. So I'd love to hear you talk about how you move across forms in your own design work. For instance, your, your last game that you were working on, which I, I think was, was published a few months ago, uh, Acephony. Um, so in, in that game, you move through a giant cave network in order to explore different scientific and spiritual mysteries. And that game seems to draw on literary genres like science fiction or speculative literature, uh, but also has an intertextuality with earlier games, you know, many of which are focused on large cave systems like the text adventure game, Colossal Cave Adventure or the independent game, uh, Kentucky Route Zero. And as with some of your other work, right, there's, there's an engagement with, with surrealism at play here as well. So could you talk a little bit through your literary artistic and game-based influences in, in, in your work? Yeah, so uh, Seven is not out yet, but it will come out, the demo is out, but the full game maybe end of this year or January. But yeah, other than that, generally, right. Um, there's a few like categories of, I guess, the way we approach influence with our games. Um, one of them is definitely current events. I mean, it's hard to get around that, but... Uh, I guess what's the recent one for like, so for Stephanie, it's the premise of that is there's like a, there's three scientists and one's from Taiwan, one's from Japan, one's from the USA, but they're all Taiwanese in their race. Um, so that's thinking a bit about uh, the current relations of those three countries, like in the present day, but also the past, like Japan colonizing Taiwan, US occupying Japan. 
uh, Taiwan looking up to Japan or the US as like cultural superiors. Um, and in that sense, it's useful to have, uh, I guess what people call nonfiction casually, right? Um, so for past games, I've referenced things like film study books about Japan. Um, what was that one? Cinema of Actuality by someone, but like those sorts of books, right? You, you can, if you're, if you're making a game and you want to think about something related to a country, well, there's, there's games get across, get at that in certain ways, but at the same time, you also want to have someone who's thought about a particular aspect in like a very deep way. Um, so, yeah. And yes. Way, yeah. 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 Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Literature and film, those can be influences as well. But I guess one thing that maybe is unique is thinking about our past works as something that the games we make or that I make, they always tend to respond to the ones before them, right? So mm -hmm. you're thinking about, oh, was the past game successful with, you know, how it talked about race in a particular way, you know? So that might get me thinking about, oh, maybe certain genre conventions or certain types of gameplay mechanics, maybe they aren't, they have certain limitations to what they can express. And so for the next game, we want to think about what's a direction we can take this to kind of talk about stuff um, in a different sense. So we, so like one example, I made a game, All Our Asias, which is speaking from a lot of my experience, hearing about Asian American identity in the USA, um, but thinking about the limitations of some of that discourse. Um, you know, through making that, uh, I got a sense of maybe the limits of talking about something super recent and contemporary and thinking about like, oh, how can you create like a more fictional setting um, such as the one in Stephanie to kind of get at these large concepts of like nationalism from a different kind of angle, something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so your your work and some of the things that Tom was saying sort of show how video games as a medium can absorb and refract other forms, literary novels, cinema, television, other games. Um, but you know, so maybe maybe Alan, like your work in some ways also opens up the other side of this equation, right? So you're, I, I know you're interested in things that a designer can do artistically with games that you can achieve in the same way with a painting or a film. Um, so we've talked about games like the Stanley Parable, for instance, uh, whose artfulness comes from experiments with choice and the limits of decision making in some ways. Uh, your games also give us impossible structures and geometries that you know, wouldn't be possible in traditional architecture, for instance. So I'm curious, you know, what are some of the unique artistic elements or formal elements that video games allow for and how does that get expressed through genre. Yeah, so like I'm personally like as an artist, very interested in the idea of um, impossible architecture and how to build those and unbuildable architecture, meaning like structure that cannot be built in the physical world, but can be built in the video game world. And for that, like what I mean is that like for like a 3D virtual world in like video game, it doesn't necessarily need to have like gravity. It probably doesn't have like, or like the construction constraints in terms of like economics or like the physical limits of like construction materials, right? So as like designers and architects, like you can, like there are like a lot of things that you can experiment with in like a video game world. And like for my work, like I'm very interested to use like impossible architecture in video game as a kind of like a psychological metaphor, like to make use of like uh, uh, spatial paradox and uh, stuff like that. And in terms of like these kind of like impossible architecture, like you might argue that like you can also do like architectural drawings on like a piece of paper or just to make it like a 3D animation and stuff like that, right? But I guess like one important feature of a video game is like, is like interactive, right? So all my games are kind of like 3D video game like format. And like, I think it's like very important that for this structure, like you got a chance to like actively explore it and try to walk around inside to feel the space, even like that kind of exploration just happening like virtually, right? I feel like that kind of active exploration helps a lot. Um, for the media that uh, you're exploring the space, exploring the story uh, by yourself instead of just like looking at like a flash screen of like images and stuff like that. 
Great. Um, so, so that gives us a space, like a sense of the uniqueness of space in video games. Right. I guess I, I, I want to go into like something that, that Tom was talking about before too, which is uh, time, right? I mean, questions of, of temporality. And Tom, maybe I'll, I'll start with you with this question. So, you know, there's, I, I really wanted to talk about this, this very small, um, in a sense, genre of time loop narratives. I mean, it's a much larger idea, but it's a, a smaller genre. And at least in the United States, right, this genre started in, um, as far as I know, in film and television. So you had things like the popular film Groundhog Day in 1993. And, you know, since that time, we've had countless examples of this. We've had uh, The Edge of Tomorrow, uh, Palm Springs, uh, Boss Level, uh, things like the television show Russian Doll. And, and this genre moves uh, also to time loop video games. So, so games that repeat the same day over and over. So things like Sexy Brutal and Minutes or, or the recent game 12 Minutes that came out um, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, an earlier example of this, right, could be like the Zelda game Majora's Mask. Um, anyway, the, the genre of time loop games or the form of reset that you mentioned before is arguably even more prominent in Japan. You know, like I've, I've played Stein's Gate, not many more examples, but you know, you've told me about the prominence of the genre following the 1992 financial crash in Japan. Um, so I, I'd love to hear you talk more about that, about the history of this time loop genre in Japan and, and how we might think about it. Yeah, I mean, I think I would begin just by, you know, offering two examples like you. Like I think Stein's Gate is a really great example, not just because it's a great game, but it does something very specific with temporal paradox that I think comes out of the game world. And the second example I think that would be really good is actually a movie, Kimi no Nawa. And maybe I would just start there because Kimi no Nawa was obviously hugely popular across the world and everyone kind of wondered why, right? At least in film circles. But in fact, Shinka, Shinkai Makoto was a game producer, right? So he produced girl games and he became very famous within this sort of artificially created genre among fans called the world genre, Sakaike. And the idea of that was simply that you had this kind of background world apocalypse going on, and then you had characters in the foreground doing something like a dating sim, right? So there was this, this gap between two temporal registers. There was this immediate emotional engagement and risk involved in dating and romance, and then the background a giant apocalypse taking place. And figuring out the relationship between the two was paradoxical because they weren't really exactly connected. What Shinkai did is he brought that kind of game problem into the world of anime uh, by using this notion of reset. And you see it in a movie like Kimi no Nawa. Each time the bell rings, the story resets and the characters are trying to find a true ending. So obviously this was hugely popular, particularly across Asia, um, but I think people were responding to it as a game. And most of the people in the cinema world had no comprehension even of what it was as a narrative. So when I think of what games do, um, it'll bring me back to Stein's Gate. It's precisely to introduce a notion of reset to connect two temporalities that don't match. So I feel like it's a little bit less of repeating the same day is resetting parameters and looking for a true ending, right? So it wouldn't be like 50 first dates, for instance, or Groundhog Day. It would be like playing a dating sim and getting a true ending, which is not a happy ending. And I think that's what Stein's Gate is all about. Of course, it's extremely emotional about it, right? Because there's different ways in which the main character, Homma, has to create new timelines and see which one he can actually keep his girlfriend alive. That, that's really helpful. I mean, because that takes us from a really specific genre of the time loop to something that's much more general about video games, especially multi-linear narrative games, but really all games in, in terms of having uh, a different experience, a different pathway uh, through a familiar game. So I, I guess because we're talking about time and temporality, another topic that we could bring up is, is history. Uh, and and Melos, I know, you know, history is really important to the way that you think about games um, in the way that you were even talking about Stephanie already. Um, and, you know, like there are a lot of games that have both a direct and maybe elliptical 
relationship to history. So like, you know, the big AAA examples that have a very direct relationship would be things like the Red Dead Redemption series, which takes up the American Western frontier in the late 19th and early 20th century, or the Assassin's Creed series, which takes you to Greece and Italy and, and the Caribbean and places like that. And more indirectly, you have games like uh, Braid, uh, which, which grapple with the legacy of the atom bomb and, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and you know, you, you've talked with me also about Asian games like Scroll of Taiwu that take on Chinese history and mythology in a direct way. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear you uh, talk about how, how you think about history as, as a game designer, either history or time, um, when, you're, when you're building out your games. Yeah, uh, so uh, we wanna, let's see, look, talk about, so as a game designer, there's a sense of, well, when you're creating, you're thinking about where in history you kind of belong to in terms of the grand timeline of game development. Um, so in that sense, it's always kind of, it's always important to keep in mind other mediums and what they've done. So studying literature and like film and thinking about what kinds of ideas those things have got at, that's as important as kind of studying games themselves. Um, so that you can better think about, oh, how can I write about whatever times I'm living in or what concerns me effectively? Otherwise, there's a tendency to kind of reproduce tropes endlessly. Um, but as in terms of a topic approaching in our game, um, you know, there is the speculative aspect to history. So Stephanie is, of course, set kind of in, in the near future. And by stepping away from like the present time and setting it in the future, that kind of gives a bit of a, it gives like a fictional space for the idea, those, these like three countries to float around in. Like, so the game's kind of set 20 years in the future and the idea that the country relations are gonna remain stable all the way up to that point, you know, maybe it's not gonna happen, but for the purpose of the game, it's enough, it's displaced enough from the players sense of time that they can kind of approach it maybe less based in their current emotional stakes relating to everyday life. Um, so there's not just that speculative exploration of history, but in Stephanie again, for an example, there's an exploration of the characters' personal histories with their countries. Um, so this is a spoiler, sorry, but I have to, <laughs> to mention it, but like in the second half of the game, um, it takes a twist from kind of like a realist cave exploration into uh, the caves kind of end up being based on key environments from the characters' lives. So like the Midwestern highways of the USA or like uh, residential or urban Tokyo. Um, so the game is after it's introduced you to these characters and kind of gotten you into this like alternate kind of sense of history or almost fantasy, it kind of goes straight back into, uh, well, no, we need to think about the characters situated in things that are kind of similar to real life. Um, and I think that kind of sense of approaching history from a kind of a fictionalized, fictionalized fantasized um, spatial standpoint is an interesting technique that games um, can do to draw into focus different parts of uh, not just like the world, but also the characters relating to them. Um, yeah, so so that yeah, gives us yeah. some sense of the of the historical, and I, you know, like when you're thinking about history, you can also think about the the immediate past or the historical present, um, and and maybe that's that's the question that I'll ask too. Is you know, like during the COVID era, and and, and Alan, um, you know, maybe I'll direct this question toward you, but anyone should come in if you if you have thoughts. So during the, the COVID era starting in, in early 2020, right, I noticed a lot of people turning to uh, slower and more social games. So this, you know, most famously maybe included things like Animal Crossing New Horizons or Among Us, um, you know, and I don't want to overstate this point because plenty of people were calling playing Call of Duty games or Monster Hunter games, for instance. But um, for some people, there was a, a different kind of desire for slow games that eased anxiety. Uh, you know, and this is a non-intuitive genre in many ways, since 
there's an assumption that all video games are about uh, velocity, speed, and hypermediation. But there, but there is this interesting set of slower games, and maybe they're not even one genre, but things like um, a short hike or you know games that were more more popular in the recent past, like Gris or puzzle games, even like Monument Valley. And um, Alan, I you know I know you've worked on a lot of VR installations and video games. Uh, some of which I describe as slow games. So, for instance, I'm thinking of your um, of your game Scent, uh, in which you control a stray dog that follows the scent of human uh, of, of trails of human fear. Uh, so, could you tell us a little bit about how you think about this this genre of slow or slower games? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, I guess like as like Patrick just said, like like for a lot of like mainstream video games, like it focuses a lot on like bombarding the player with like a lot of like visual and audio information and like demands the player to make like very quick decisions and move their thumbs like super quickly to react to like the game system, right? And I guess like slow games are kind of like the opposite of that. And like uh, one thing that I would also like to talk about is like like from like um, this book, like how uh, the products of space, like by, by <laughs> a bachelor art, like um, the book like mentioned about this experience, like when you were like reading like a book about like an author's like childhood, right? And the author like described about like, his like, childhood home and stuff like that. And then like the reader could like sometimes like start to think about like their own like, childhood home. So like the experience shift from like the narrative in the book to like how the reader's like own like the mental world, right? And I guess like video game is like a really fascinating medium to like try to do that instead of like try to bombard people with like information. And like, stuff like that. And like one of my favorite games in this genre is like in fact a Euro Truck Simulator that you just like drive like a truck for like a really long time and you can listen to the noise of from the road and you can look at like, the sky and that almost costs like a daydreaming state, uh, which can be beautiful. And for my game like sense, like it's also this kind of like slow game that like uh, there's nothing that uh, there's nothing much that you can do apart from just as a dog that you would just walk around and to look at things. So this game like stands like you play as like a straight up and you wander around like the border of like a fictional city where like a massacre is happening. So like, like you, as like a thought, like, like you witness a lot of like human brutality and like violence and you can do nothing about it. So it's like to see like human violence from like an animal like perspective is kind of like the core idea of the, of the game and stuff like that. And I guess like for like total, like a lot of people gone through the experience of um, lockdown or like go for the like, quarantine, right? And when you're locked inside like a hotel room for like three weeks, like your sense of time like kind of like changes and stuff like that. And I feel like to play like slow games in this kind of time, like kind of like reflect like an interesting mental state of um, how we're going through this COVID era as well. Yeah, there's, I mean, you're right. There's like all of these games that are about the ordinary or the mundane now. I mean, there's like mm -hmm. Power Wash Simulator. There's, you know, Goat Simulator, right, yeah. a little goofier. But, you know, I mean, there are a lot of games that um, not only slow things down, but also shift the focus from the kinds of games that Tom was talking about, right? The the big, the apocalyptic, the global mm. um, to, to matters that are much more uh, personal or, or small, right? I mean, I think about games like Gone Home, in the United States, where it's like right. a single person moving through through you know the, their family home, and like there's not much that happens in some ways. I mean, there's a lot of history, there's a lot of storytelling, there's a mood, um, but there but there aren't grand events, there aren't villains, there's not melodrama um, in this kind of binary good evil sense. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe we just have a few minutes left, but I'd love to hear, just to close us off from each of you, uh, kind of a very open-ended question. Just um, when you think about the present and the future of, of genre across Asia, what do you think about? You know, like some, what are some uh, directions that you, that you see maybe already happening or just on the horizon? And this can be either for well-known genres, right? Things like first person shooters or real time strategy games or role playing games, or this can be for more divergent areas like the slow games that we were just talking about or art games um, kind of more generally. So um, yeah, maybe, maybe let's start with Tom and just, I would love to hear from each of you uh, in a kind of summary way. Um, 
Yeah, I guess this is much as a hope is a prediction, but I, as I mentioned at the outset, um, you know, there's a strong tradition of amateur games in Japan, for instance, and it's partly because of the way these cross media franchises have often functioned and allowed for this lateral space. And, you know, as early as the 90s, I started seeing at the, the, the big manga um, events like Komiket and Komitia, lots of people um, developing amateur games. It feels to me like even with the rise of cell phone games, this should be more popular. And I know there is like a movement for this in Japan, but I'm hoping that is the trend, right? Because there's a way in which the capital and the resources you need now, when you look at something at like Persona 5, it's incredible, but at the same time, who can really command those resources? And I think there is a, is a certain amount of pushback now from the realm of people trying to produce independent games. And so, yeah, that's, that's my feeling, right? That cell phone is, I hope, because it's so dominant now, it's gonna produce a lot of kind of alternative games. Yeah, the, there definitely are movements of indie games and well, doji in circles, but also people who, who identify as indie creators here. Um, cell phone games. Yeah, I've seen, I'm not sure about on the Japanese side, but I know on the Western side, there is a slight, well, I mean, it used to exist with flash games, right? But games that you can just play on a browser right away, HTML games. But on the other hand, with mobile games, there's always the issues of it being mostly held by like Google and I and Apple and the kind of like gatekeeping they do and the, <laughs> the arcane restrictions they put on updating games that always makes what looks like a great medium to circulate games, makes it kind of difficult at times. But thinking about the future of games, um, thinking about what, you're, what Thomas was saying about resets and like time loops and temporality, it made me think about the presence of multiple endings in some of my games, but also games I've played like, like Undertale. And hearing about it popularizing after the economic crash and thinking about maybe the presence of hearing about issues around the world. I wonder if part of developers indulging in having multiple endings, but also the popular love of it is related to kind of the desire for different outcomes from then from the present or like indulging in the fantasy of things going wrong. Um, and so I wonder if in Asia, at least on the indie side, I'd always like to hope for more engagement with like, or things just kind of drawing on the present day in a way that isn't necessarily like full on, you know, like Assassin's Creed kind of history channel broadness or something. Um, you know, people engaging like speculatively with what's happened around the world or maybe what will happen. Um, not to be like, oh, you know, what if there's a nuclear attack in Tokyo tomorrow, but more of just on different sorts of scales, not always apocalyptic versus non apocalyptic, but like you know, just people engaging more with what's going on around them. Uh, you know. Great, Alan, uh, we'd love to hear from you too on this, if you have any, any sure. thoughts, predictions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess it's always hard like, to predict the future of like a particular game genre. But um, one thing that I can see is that like, um, like game design software or so-called like, game engines like Unreal or like Unity are being taught in like a lot of art school, design school, architecture schools or even like high schools. And then from my experience, like a lot of like the students who are learning this software, like are they not coming from like gaming background? Like when they don't game, like they don't have like a lot of knowledge about a particular genre and stuff like that. So they don't go into like the class to try to make like a first person shooter or try to make like a stretch game. And I think like those are very interesting students because they don't have like a fixed idea of like what games are like. So they just try to make like what they want to make as like a creative person using uh, game technologies, right? And there's also no game industry in Hong Kong, so they don't have like the pressure to like graduate with like a great game project to get like a job in a pen or something. So like, I think there are a lot, a lot of really interesting experiments like going on in this school that's sort of like making games but like also making more games as well. So I guess like that kind of forms like an experimental spirit for what could happen for the future of like gaming in the Hong Kong 
perhaps like stuff with like um, experimental architecture and like virtual world. But like one thing that I really want to see is like um, teenagers or like young people would make really short, casual mini games like they make uh, YouTube videos, just like a five minute video, but in like a game format that's like, easy and very accessible to make, like to express their own story. So games can be like a self-expression to people like young people and they can pick many formats and genres and stuff like that. Thank you for those thoughts. So our, our hour has just evaporated because there were so many interesting responses from you all. <laughs> uh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Melos. And thank you, Alan. Um, and I'm just going to hand it back over to uh, Gigi at the University of Chicago Hong Kong Center, who has been very central to organizing this, uh, this series. So thank you, Gigi. And if you want to give us some final announcements. Professor Lamar, Lamelos, Ellen, and Professor Jogoda, thank you so much for tonight's wonderful discussion. Discuss this discussion has surely helped shed new insights on the various video game genres in Asia. And most importantly, we have explored and expect our popular culture from an academic perspective. Thank you so much. We have a brief poll on tonight's program for the audience on Zoom. If you are watching us live on Facebook or YouTube, you can leave your answers in the comments below. Make sure to follow our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Union Campus website for further information. Good night. <laughs>